Hello, I'm horror cartoonist Dennis St. John. I draw monsters and write twisted tales. As you can imagine, I was a little obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Lucky for me, so were most of my high school friends. All except one. One friend who stubbornly refused to join the Scoobies. So here we are, 20 some odd years later. I'm teaming up with Doc Travis, John Teach Landis, and maybe a special guest or two. And we're going to make our friend, Michael Poli, watch one episode of Buffy a week until he's no longer the Buffy Virgin. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the next episode of Buffy Virgin. I am your host, Dennis St. John. We have with us everyone who will now introduce themselves in order. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the Virgin. I've only seen Buffy up to season three, episode 18, Earshot. My name's John. Uh, I'm one of the guys who's on the show. <laughs> they call him Teach. My name's Travis. They call me Scalpel, like just all the time. My closest friends and total strangers. <laughs> <laughs> they just—they don't even know your prof- they profession. Know. Like, oh, that guy's Scalpel, right? <laughs> uh, so this episode, we are watching Earshot. Um, but before we get into any of that, uh, we're going to go into reactions um, and... Uh, I'm going to thank people for leaving us a review on uh, iTunes. Uh, it really helps. I mean, I'm even going to thank surf to die for who left us a one-star review. And we are going to now have John make fun of you for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's read it first. He says, uh, better off dusted than listening to this one. <laughs> they waffled on endlessly about their own lives, promised to get back to the show topic, then yammered on about each other for <laughs> another 15 minutes. I slogged through one episode, but when the next one was just as brutally inane and boring, I gave up on them. I doubt we ever promised to get back to topic. That sounds like bullshit to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just... Uh, I would like to say that I think that we should be off topic more often. I think that the only thing that makes this interesting, if it is interesting to anyone, is uh, that we connect Buffy to our personal lives, not that we talk about Buffy. There's about a trillion podcasts that do that. I mean, there's probably also a trillion podcasts by like suburban men talking about TV shows and their own lives. I mean, that's not original either, but uh, I'm just not going to apologize for any of that. <laughs> yes, we find you laughable, surf to die for. <laughs> um, we are going to thank uh, Dan, Danu Midwife um, for leaving us a really nice review. Uh, I feel like you kind of get what we want to do and everything, so that's really nice. As I say, I look forward to every week to this podcast. Um, I'm vindicated because they, they, they wish we would edit out the pauses, and I am totally on board with that, but... Um, Danu Midwife, I am not in charge of that at all, but I like, I like your suggestion. Yeah. I also think she, or they, uh, or him, uh, calls out like that. We are an amateur podcast. Like that's what we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's no, like, there's no shame in that. This is We're not. Trying. We're trying. We're trying. All right. Um, so let's move on to the episode. I just want to, before we get into like a summary or anything, I just want to say, I don't know how deep and heavy into themes we're going to get this episode, but this episode has mass shootings and suicides. So we're probably going to talk about it. Um, so I just, at the top of the show, want to say, if you're feeling suicidal, if you have these urges, there's um, the national suicide hotline number is one 800 273 eight two five five um and if you don't want to talk on the phone if you're more comfortable texting you can text home to seven four one seven four one um but you know this episode it gets heavy but is also really funny um so let's move on to the summary provided by lando the summary it's patrol time time for a little rough and tumble at the playground Nothing new for Buffy, except these aren't just your everyday vampires or demons. They're twin demons with no mouths. Buffy handily impales one of them while the other one runs off into the shadows and some shimmery demon juice quietly soaks into Buffy's hand. When her hand starts to itch, a little research reveals that Buffy may have been infected with an aspect of the demon. 
Everyone has a good time trying to guess just which demonic aspect Buffy will develop, but they don't have to guess for long. By the next day, Buffy has begun reading the minds of those around her. At first, reading thoughts seems great. Buffy could read her enemies' minds. She can listen in on Xander's every creeptastic thought. She can even cheat in English class. But before long, the drawbacks are obvious. As the Buffster's ESP becomes esp -er, the collective thoughts of Sunnydale High become increasingly loud and numerous. Buffy can't handle it. She swoons. But not before she hears a single voice above the crowd. This time tomorrow, I'll kill you all. Buffy awakes, surrounded by friends, but still unable to cope with the oppressive din of everyone else's inner monologues. She sends off the Scoobies to interrogate the student body and find the would-be killer before he or she strikes. Buffy herself is unable to help with the interrogation as the voices continue to overwhelm her, finally placing her into a coma. While the gang interrogates the denizens of SDHS, Angel takes matters into his own fangs, tracking down the second mouthless demon and removing his heart so that Giles and Mini Giles can mix up a potion to cure Buffy. Finally free of her cross-cognitive curse, Buffy rushes to the school, just in time to catch Jonathan in the school's clock tower, assembling a rifle. You see, for three seasons now, no one's ever noticed Jonathan. No one's ever listened to him. And that's why he's decided to kill. Himself? It seems... Buffy is just in time to help Jonathan past his own suicidal moment, but he isn't actually the one planning to hurt others. No, it turns out that it was the evil lunch lady. It seems that years of serving up slop to the pimple set has driven her to pour an entire box of Acme brand rat poison into the school's jello supply. So Buffy smacks her around, and all is again well. The end. Alright, thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, Great Lines. Great lines. Um, I really like the uh, when Willow's reading the school paper. She goes, "The school paper is edging on depressing lately." You guys notice that? I don't know. I always go straight to the obits. <laughs> this is so dark. <laughs> That's life on the Hellmouth, man. Um, and while Buffy is reading people's minds, there's some really good ones. Um, and I like Oz's. Buffy is all of us. We think, therefore, she is. That's pretty uh, deep. That is awesome. Uh, so for me, um, at the end of the episode, um, Buffy, and Je Buffy and Giles are talking, and Buffy's like, Giles, I think Jonathan likes me. And Giles says, you should take Jonathan with you to prom. That would really boost his confidence. And Buffy goes, what am I, St. Buffy? He's like freaking <laughs> tall. <laughs> like, just great. Buffy is just like not having it. <laughs> I like the do. What am I, St. Buffy? She kind of is. Uh, I like when Cordelia says, I've never cheered so hard in my life. I still have knee marks on my back. From the pyramid? <laughs> <laughs> She's so over the Scooby gang. I like this one that feels a little bit anachronistic. Oh. It's, like, it's just part of the what's magical about this episode, uh, Xander. Yeah, I mean, who hasn't just idly thought about taking out the whole place with a semi-automatic? I said idly. Yeah. Oh my god. It's really like uh It's the a joke. Right there. <laughs> There's so many jokes in this episode that you would never get in a not modern show and we'll get it. Literally that. made on the last day that you could make that joke. Is it, yeah. Did this come out yeah. April 13th? Not not exact. We'll talk about it. It was filmed before then, but yeah. All right, let's move on to weird noticings and trivia. Weird noticings. So uh, the episode begins with Buffy being chased by two monsters, um, and I just think the demons look really great this episode. Uh, they don't get a name, but they're called the Scabby Demons, um, which I feel like is underselling how crazy looking they are. Uh, they don't have mouths. Uh, they're full body suits, which is always like a tough choice to go for the full body suits, uh, but their, their faces look great. Um, yes, but... The uh, liquid on Buffy's hand that like disappears into her hand is maybe the worst special effect in all of season three. 
That is a real race for more special yeah, no shit. <laughs> I think well, that snake demon, I think, will raise you. <laughs> that snake demon was bad. In, was that uh, season three? Band, in Band Candy? Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. You know, Band Candy gets a big reference this episode. Yeah, it yeah. does. <laughs> Yeah, they're really, uh, they really are showing off their CG budget this season. <laughs> it looks like the co- it looks like it's bleeding the color from outer space. She just left it there because it was so weird. It's like, who's gonna come and move this body? They're gonna get that fluid all over them. <laughs> it's like she just like killed it on a picnic table and left it. <laughs> the dogs. It's like, dude, who's cleaning up this fucking crazy demon body? Yeah, that's true. I, you know, that's I, a that, really I, good point. I, this happens so often, I forget about it. Like the early the early morning dog walkers are gonna be like, fuck, what is that? <laughs> I like that Oz is interested in a potential wear dog when Buffy is uh, describing her patrol like two days in the, the, in the next few days. She says like, I thought I saw a four-legged demon. It was a dog. A wear dog. Um, I want to know what a wear dog would be. <laughs> you know? How is a wear dog different than a werewolf? It's like a werewolf, but with uh, floppier ears and a better disposition. What if it was a dog that was bitten by a werewolf? Yeah. What if it is a dog. Oh. What if it's human like, three days out of the month? Yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> and what if it's a dog that becomes a wolf for three days? Another good point. Those are all great. Those would be great Rick and Morty episodes. I love it. <laughs> Fan fiction. It's happening. Uh, John? Uh, we already kind of covered it in good lines, but I, I, I really like that this uh, Sunnydale High School student paper has an obituary section. It's another reference to the fact that maybe Buffy's not saving all the lives. I mean, she's <laughs> saving some, but it might be kind of pointless, as is Joyce would say. Gonna, is anybody going to call out all the weird headlines in the paper? <laughs> oh, they're so good. Did we yeah, pause the screen good. on that? Uh, I, mean, I, felt like, I, I felt like that would be something John would do. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. I should. There was a good one that was like apathy on the rise. No one cares. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, they were all like you know high school onion headline kind of things. They were really fun. That whole like high school newspaper character in that world was a really fun, weird trip. I enjoyed that. Yeah, I like that the student newspaper is apparently just run completely by one guy. <laughs> it does like all the yeah. reviews, everything. Freddie Graves, a red herring this episode. Oh, there's so much red herring this episode. Oh yeah, so this is like the first time like athletics was a good thing in Buffy in the Buffyverse, but it's also like uh, it's kind of like weird because Willow, that Percy guy, is still like under Willow's charm, and it's like he's still doing whatever she wants, and then he she's like, I have to pay attention to him. He needs or wait, I have to applaud. He needs my he needs attention or, or craves attention or something. Yeah, yeah, it was just like the weirdest. Like w- we're still having this plot. Hold on, we, we like shredded like so many plots that we're not following up, but no, we're going to follow but Yeah, up. the Percy one is continuing. <laughs> hey, I forgot about this plot. I'm like, I, what I the also, hell's happening? I, I've always thought of that as like, even there's a certain point where maybe like even the outsiders, like in a high school, do go to one game or, or like, I'm, yeah, you know, my hostility doesn't need to be sustained this much. I'm not. <laughs> but then again, it's at the end of, you know, they're all seniors, so. I think in in real high school, at, when we were all seniors, you know, I think like the you know the animosity level dropped off towards the end of the year. Yeah, I like. Yes, it, it, I still didn't of, go to sports games though. <laughs> we still call them sports games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it reminds me kind of that uh, Freaks and Geeks episode where the, the freaks get really into a basketball game because like their car gets vandalized by the either t- by the other team or something so it ends with them like <laughs> passionately cheering for the basketball team uh travis you have oh. uh, a critique of the watchers council yeah the watcher council just really sucks they have no info on anything and they're still like wesley's still like a really cringy character this episode i think it's cringe factor increases this episode it definitely <laughs> increases and he's kind of just so petty and uh, but he's called Pierce Brosnan, which is crazy. I mean, he just has dark hair like Pierce Brosnan, but <laughs> it's just a weird reference. It's a reference from the '90s because no one would ever think, no one would ever associate Pierce Brosnan with James Bond otherwise. Well, he has a, he has dark enough. He has a look. Yeah. He could totally do like a look alike thing. Like if you were at a corporate yeah. function and you're like playing roulette, and he could be like, uh, you know, like the roulette guy or whatever, and you'd be like, oh, James Bond. 
Well, yeah. I mean, it's Wait. like it's like in the nineteen nineties, he got the Brosnan haircut. You know, there's like the Rachel haircut for women. Like he's got the Brosnan. Can I hear more about Mike's crazy workplace where there's a roulette lookalike game? This is what you do at work? Oh, I may have dived a little bit too deep <laughs> in that fantasy. So I worked for a little while with a guy who worked as a Pierce Brosnan impersonator. <laughs> you guys would love this. Are you, it was his part-time job? Or? This guy who is a Pierce Brosnan impersonator got a lot of work as, as a Pierce Brosnan lookalike. And he would totally get hired to these parties, corporate parties, where they'd have like a Monte Carlo night to be just the Bond character. Oh, uh, wait, so okay. he would just like walk around like in character, in persona? That's correct. <laughs> I, I love that you brought this up as something we could all relate to. <laughs> well, I spent so much time with this person, all of these things became normal. And uh, they're not, <laughs> I learned. That's amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to necessarily call him out. I don't know if he's still doing that. Let me just double check to see what he's up to. All right, let's move on while Mike is doing research. Uh, no, I've so- done the research. <laughs> anyway, I just shared a YouTube link. Are we Do- going to watch this together? Uh, sure, why not? Let's watch Maybe. this. <laughs> <laughs> the name is Reikley. Glenn Reikley. Did you film this Welcome. Mike? I don't know if I filmed this. 2008? Yeah, I probably did. You totally did. (laughs) (laughs) He's got the finger gun. You don't have to have an ordinary party. Make it unique. Make it a Bond. James Bond. (laughs) Look at all these fine companies that couldn't say no. Donald Donald Trump. Trump. Whoa. This guy's worked for Trump. (laughs) This should be redacted. No matter where in the world you are, you can find me, Glenn007.com. Oh my God, he's not even trying on the accent. Why is he not doing the accent? (laughs) And remember, the martinis are shaken. Oh, he's kind of trying. See you at a party soon. Wow. Thank you for sharing this. Oh man, that's Mike. rough, Mike. That's rough. How does this go? So like you hire him, he comes to your party, and then what happens? Everyone's like, you just this play guy around. who's vaguely famous looking. Have you guys ever planned a party? I mean, how cool would it be to have I'll James Bond at your party? <laughs> but like, what does he do? Is he just you stand know what? there it's looking? Just, you know what? Because it's not Commander Kirk. That's why you're so... <laughs> Commander <laughs> Kirk! <laughs> No, but he just does he just stand there? Or do you like ask him questions? Is he like play is he in character? Was at your party, you'd be like, guys, also Magneto is here. <laughs> it's kind of like the way they plan kids' parties, but for adults, right? It's the same mentality, you know. But does he perform? Is there like a is there a shtick? Is there? Yeah, a... He comes dressed in a full suit, and then he a- has Bond. But he's in character. Yeah, he has With an like... American accent. I mean, whatever you heard. I think that's the accent he does. <laughs> He's no Alexis Denisov. I'll give him, I'll say that. So oh, he like, he improvs he certainly looks like a Pierce Bond Rose. character. He looks He's, like Hasselhoff. That's what one of the comments said. He's watched all the movies. He, you could like, you know, could ask him about Moonraker and he'd be like, oh yes, that was the time that I was on a Moonraker. You wouldn't ask him about a Roger Moore movie. No, he would only know about the <laughs> <laughs> There's communal right. knowledge. <laughs> like There's communal Bond knowledge. Oh wow, Mike! That's a very strange chapter of your past. Topic, dog. We need to get back on top. Oh no, <laughs> Surf Four, Surf Two, Four, Die, or whatever his name is, is. Uh, oh my God! Is, uh, he's now gonna be very, very displeased oh. that we're talking about the James Bond impersonator. I don't think this counts as our life. This is <laughs> somebody else's life. Also, it'd be really funny if he was still hate listening to it at this point. <laughs> oh no, he listened to the first episode and was like, "Fuck this." <laughs> so uh once the group finds out buffy's psychic um we get to see how they all react and i think it's like telling about their characters so cordelia really just says what she's thinking like it's basically just her thoughts are like on like a two second delay yeah. from her mouth <laughs> uh willow is like genuinely worried about a lot of stuff like is buffy even human is like is this power taking Oz away from her, or, you know, complicated thoughts, but like emotional. Um, Oz has inner depths. <laughs> Oz is basically Descartes. Um, <laughs> and Xander may have improved marginally this season, but in his thoughts, in his mind, in his heart, he's really horn dog Xander. <laughs> so that's my assessment. Oh, and oh. Uh, of course, 
uh, Wesley is a bad boy, a naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> I like that uh, we got uh, interrogation Willow back. Yeah, yes. they're like going around, and like it's interesting that she also goes. She immediately goes back. The first interrogation we see is she interrogates Jonathan again. She goes yeah. right back to her old habits. And the best part, she's like all about fantasies. She, she is like the weirdest interrogator. Like that's what she says. Fantasies are wonderful, or aren't fantasies wonderful? And he's like, okay, <laughs> what is going to happen? That's such a weird scene because you know you want. I watched that interrogation scene deliberately again after the episode played out because I was like wait, was there a clue that something was up? There are no clues in that scene. <laughs> this episode has, is just, everything is diverting you from everything else. It is insane. I'd say there's a clue in the scene where Buffy grabs Jonathan and just that he's like, she noticed me. Like, yeah. And before it, he's like, she doesn't even notice me. Like, just where, where he's at. Did, remind me, did we ever have a, a scene where she actually said his name after after the season, after the episode where she's like, you there. <laughs> oh, at the party? At the party. Did, she said Jonathan right since then. Because I feel like that was like a momentous occasion. Like, <laughs> she knows my name. I don't think so, right? I have not seen a prediction about it. <laughs> um, yeah, we should have been keeping tighter. I feel like there was an episode after that where he was somebody used his name. I'm like, not sure she's ever screamed his name. Yeah, Will always used his name. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know I mean, if Buffy ever know who he is because his name has been brought up before. Yeah, <laughs> that slippery little fish. All right, uh, John. Uh, yeah, I just noticed that when uh, Angel brings the heart of the demon to Buffy, it's a glowing blue liquid with chunks in it. So I want to know: Did Angel? It's supposed to be its heart. So did Angel pull out the heart and like put it in a food processor? Did he blend uh, it up? Before he gets the heart, there's a scene where Giles and Wesley are putting ingredients and grinding stuff into the same oh, container. Oh, okay. So I think the heart must just be like a part of the spell. I see. So I bet so they're, they're making a potion already, and then they have to use the heart as like in one step of making the potion. Yeah. So I bet I see. he did food processor it, and I would never use that food processor again. <laughs> uh, Mike? Oh yeah. Um, so this is a, I have a prediction about this. So seeing, uh, well, I guess when Buffy reveals that she, you know, discovers through Joyce's thoughts, apparently Joyce is always thinking about this apparently <laughs> that, uh, she and Giles had sex twice on top of a cop car during the hard candy episode, the, the band candy episode. I, I was totally thrown by that scene. It was hard candy for Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, twice on top of a cop car, huh? That's pretty pretty baller story. <laughs> it's weird that Giles doesn't give any of that away. Like, it seems like for Joyce, it's like a don't think about an elephant thing. And when she's with Buffy, she's really worried about it, so she can't help but think about it. But then Giles apparently has no problem forgetting it. Giles is on his plate. He's got he's you know he's trying to figure he's trying to problem solve. You know that, that's where that's his mode he was in. But it was like probably the be one of the best lines ever was at the very end of the episode where she's telling, where he, when she says something, he runs into a tree. Like the actress is so happy when she says it. I think she knows how amazing a line that is. <laughs> there was like glee. You could hear the glee in, in Sarah Michelle Geller's voice when she says that line at the end. It, it was the line, which is, sure, we can work it after school. You know, if you're not too busy having sex with my mother. <laughs> <laughs> like... She, there was some genuine joy in that line. It was pretty great. It's a I reverse on, Yo Mama joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read on one of the things I was looking at today that uh, the walking into a tree was Anthony Stewart Head's idea, and he was surprised they let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very slapstick. Like walk into a tree. <laughs> so the other part here that was kind of funny, uh, when they go to approach the, you know, the dude that runs the newspaper or whatever, he's like, you guys are here to get me because of the review <laughs> about how it was eight my baby sucks. And like my first thought wasn't like, eh, maybe it was like, you got to ignore that shit. Oz, your band's great. I like all the scenes where your band is in. You got to ignore those shitty reviews. You got to make good music. Your, your own generation can't judge that stuff, man. No, I like the way that uh, he talks about his music because he's always been self-deprecating about his music and it's, he doesn't need the band to be good for it to be worth his time, which I think is kind of cool. Oh, very like true. Podcast. Yeah. yeah, like this podcast, exactly. <laughs> like this amateur like, podcast. I, I feel like the, there could have been more to that. It could have been like, you know, that's why that's why um, 
Uh, that's why Oz was there. But then like, and then, then the, with that guy would turn to Will and be like, and, and I thought you were here to bust me for all those, for the expose I was writing as you, for you as a substitute teacher. <laughs> and like, and you were the, like, you about the, being the number one school bully, bully to Buffy. Like, I feel like there was like several things he could have been working on. I do like after they find out it's not him and stuff. And then Buffy walks in the room and they go into immediate like planning mode right in front of him. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then there's a shot after they all leave of him and he doesn't even seem that puzzled by it. Like, okay. He knows they run the school. But I think a good reporter would have gone with them. Would have been like, this, I got a scoop. Did you guys notice the uh, room that, that he writes from? That it's, I guess, I mean, I don't know. When we were in school, the newspaper was a class and it was, you know, took place in like an English classroom or something. But there's apparently a newspaper room that's just his office because it's just one desk that he apparently owns and sits yeah. in. He runs the paper. This is like the other like uh, spinoff show that happened at the exact same time that just oh. never aired where he's like the detective journalist. It's like Kolchak the Night Stalker where he's like solving every crime. <laughs> And every single time he's like, oh, it's just Buffy related. <laughs> Dude, don't even get me started. I mean, we were in the newspaper. We met in the library and stuff. This is also really similar to how the newspaper room is set up in Smallville. Yeah. And this is a lot of weird go early and say, I miss typewriters. Like he had this, he had a late model typewriter on the desk, no computer, although presumably you, he would have been drafting on that on a computer to publish the newspaper, but he just had this awesome old typewriter like it was bomb i was like looking at that and be like whoa that's really cool <laughs> there would be a computer but there's no one no one to teach him how to use it yeah go high school <laughs> that's sad uh mike you got an analysis here oh well so as i was watching this episode i'm sure everyone was thinking this but like i'm seeing basically the premise for true blood uh you know the charlene harris series and i looked it up charlene harris's book series uh that became True Blood, the Sookie Sackhouse series, Dead Until Dark, came out in May 2001. So oh, very so likely stealing. Yeah. that the idea for a person over here thoughts, except the vampire's thoughts, uh, you know, this idea clearly stated in this episode. So I, I don't know how much, you know, Buffy reverberates throughout urban fantasy in the 2000s. But it oh, it's got to be huge. It's it's, like it was a, a huge. Yeah, culturally, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> I, I also interpret that scene as like, you know, maybe Angel is telling the truth about like how like the reflection of his mind works, or maybe he just doesn't like think in a normal way that people can hear. Like, <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> he's just like, I guess that's why you can't hear it. Because <laughs> he's like a gorilla. <laughs> oh, oh, man, we didn't do the funny line where he's like, I've been, I don't want a bad girl like Faith. I've been with dozens or more of those women before. <laughs> That's weird. Buffy's like, this honesty thing is rough. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. He's, you know, whatever, however old he is. Like, he also mentions his age, and he doesn't say anything about the, like, thousands of years he spent in hell. They're just not counting that, I guess. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Maybe he's Hello. talking about like all of the bad all girls demons. that he met in hell. <laughs> those are the real bad girls. Is he talking about all the bad girls he slept with as a, as a monster or as yeah. like a human? I feel like he's know. talking about like Drusilla and Darla. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Those girls might be worse than Faith, right? Yeah. Well, you might I find think out. so. Higher body count anyway. So, so far. So far. So far. Of, you know a couple hundred years to build up <clears throat> oh um, man so i don't remember there being a clock tower on the sunnydale campus before <laughs> the, save the clock tower <laughs> that that sniper's nest seems new <laughs> <laughs> i think i think i think we've seen exterior shots that could have a clock tower it's not that it's not that high up it's not like super i don't know i believe it but I don't know. Usually, it, I mean, it's like it's in the middle of the building. It's in the middle of the quad. Usually, clock towers would be like yeah. facing the front. You it designed seems. the whole building around the clock tower. It's not some off to the left thing. It's yeah. like there's so much <laughs> symmetry in these in architecture. It's insane where it's positioned. I'm pretty sure they built this for the episode. Totally. 
I just I think it's funny that when Cordelia is looking for Jonathan, she like grabs every short boy and like stares intently at her face, at their face. Like I am going to figure out if you're Jonathan or not. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of Jonathan, of course, uh, in the this pivotal scene where you know he's like slowly putting together a rifle, it just like the intent on his face is so strange. I just I don't have the sense he knows how guns work in any scene where he's where the guns are happening. I know it's all done very deliberately and like almost as if he's under a spell or something. I have, I have a lot of questions about why Jonathan's doing this stuff, but uh, it just doesn't look like he knows how it works. Also, I mean, we'll get to this as an aside, but like if you're going to kill yourself, I, the rifle seems very out of place as the right tool. And it's more of this TV red herring stuff to like make us be worried about other students. Uh, also location. I mean, everything. I mean, we'll get into it, but uh it just I everything about that scene as I was watching it made me feel uncomfortable. Like this can't be happening. This doesn't make any like everything about this feels strange. Like there has to be a spell or something. Uh, anyway, yeah, he definitely doesn't seem to like. I thought about that while he was holding the gun. That like the butt of the rifle was like under his arm, and I was like, the real recoil from that is going to go bonkers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so then they've got no time to wrap up the episode and we'll, we'll talk about this, I'm sure more, but like, uh, and then, so Xander is right. They are trying to kill the kids with rat poison. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love the, the comical giant box. It just says, it's like, it's like from a Wile E. Coyote cartoon or something. It just says rat poison. <laughs> it's like there's a crate of dynamite. That's a wooden crate with this big word dynamite spray painted on it. Well, you don't want your rat poison to be confused. You don't want to have like a your rat poison and your dog food right next to each other right i yelled at my laptop i said no <laughs> <laughs> did you like how the voice the voice that buffy heard was like you know warbled so you couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman was that a good effect i didn't think about it you really you weren't like yeah this is kind of cop out it's kind of cool like they're like so much anger they came and, and becomes, told us yeah, it's yeah. something else well, I like the premise of the mystery of them trying yeah. to figure out whose voice, because there's a they, they know that someone's plot, plotting something, and the idea of them trying to solve a school shooting before it happens is like kind of a fun, crazy story. So I was totally hooked on that idea, yes. but then like where it goes, like uh, you know, made no sense. But like you know, I like the premise, and I love that. It, I love anytime there's detective work and people doing interrogations, like when the team splits up to do it. This is like not the first time this has happened. It's great. I love that. I feel like I feel like if it was filmed now, they'd do a whole season like this would be the the pilot of like the show, like and then the, the whole season is finding out who said that. Right. You know, yeah. but Buffy, it's like, give me five minutes, give me, give me fifteen minutes. We're gonna have this. We're gonna have this MF wrapped up. You know what I mean? It's like no more stuff to cover. <laughs> uh, so before we finish up uh, the weird noticing survey, I just wanted to pull from the Wikipedia. This is what um, it says about the broadcast. Um, the Columbine High School Massacre occurred one week before the episode was originally scheduled to air. Uh, because it included a scene with a student loading a rifle, apparently for mass murder, but in reality for suicide, the WB um, substituted a rerun of Bad Girls, and the episode was delayed until September 1999, two weeks prior to the season four premiere. So just to give the context of where we were um, when this episode aired. Oh, I'm surprised they pulled it. That makes sense. I mean, I wasn't watching Buffy Beat a week, but uh, and I, I have no sense of how many shows were altered or moved. That's that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I yeah. think the the finale was shifted to the summer as well, right? It was, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have more more of this info in the future podcasts. Uh, let's move on to questions for group. Questions for the group. All right, Mike. Yep. Uh, so I got the first question here. Um, so I love the idea of being able to hear people's thoughts. And what are the first few things you think you would do if you could hear everyone's thoughts? And then I have a follow-up question. What would you do if you found out it was permanent? So first things you would do if you could hear everyone's thoughts around you. Um, yeah, I feel like this would be a definite, like, be careful what you wish for situation where I might want to know what people really think about me and then be like, oh, I wish I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're talking to some girl you barely know and she puts a necklace around your neck and you're like, she's like, come on, what do you wish? Well, <laughs> I wish I really knew what Mr. Jones thought about me. And it's like, everything goes black. Yeah. 
I'd like to know, like, sometimes when you're driving and you're dealing with, like, maniacs on the road, like, what are they thinking? I'd like to actually know that. I, there seems to be very few advantages to this. I mean, you could use it to make money. Solve crimes. Yeah, I guess you could solve certain crimes, but, like, what would you do once you knew? Like, would you be like, all right, everybody, I'm a psychic, so bleh. Or would you have to find, you'd have to then go and find some other way to prove it if people didn't believe you were a psychic. Yeah. Dude, this I, sounds like the setup for another TV like, show. Yeah. <laughs> I spent the better part of a decade rehearsing what I'd do if I somehow <laughs> solved a crime but didn't have any legitimate way to explain how I'd solved that crime. Well, I yeah, don't want to solve crimes. <laughs> obviously, day one, you go to a jail and you listen to all the prisoners are thinking, right? I mean, the, the crazy thing is like, with this power, you can separate people, what they present, from you know this reality that they hide from the world and to find out if it's truthful or not and like that power is so insane obviously like i'm scared of what would happen with me and my wife because you know we present one version of reality to each other and that would be terrifying and then obviously my work colleagues you know there's that next level that's terrifying and then going out into the world is really scary because you know i assume everyone's like hey you know but you're like they're like yeah man where am i gonna give her that body you know like whatever they're thinking <laughs> like that seems really scary for my improv career, it's amazing because I can know exactly where the scenes are going. So my, my performance ability would you know, be just insane. I can tell what the audience is thinking, what they'd like to see. Um, I could be a magician, which is not necessarily what I want to do, but I could be a magician like that because, you know, like mind reading, no problem. So I feel like my career as a performer takes off, but my personal life falls apart uh, in the long yeah. run if it was a permanent power. Yeah. Well, I also think like there's the two options of what happens if it's permanent. It could be like this Buffy thing where you can't control it and you go insane. Or it could be the, the like X-Men thing of like you learn to control it. You learn to shut out the voices when you don't need it. It depends on like what your level of control is. Like that's why you need Charles Xavier to help train you. <laughs> You're right. Buffy is a like this is her totally started the mutant origins of Buffy on the X Men. Oh my gosh, you're totally right. No, it, it depends on who your comic book publisher is going to be. So you got to get that. That's what you got to get ironed out first, and then you'll decide how you fare. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way that they, I, I'm going to pull up the Buffy Monster Manual for a minute. Nice. Um, so that the way they talk about uh, Buffy's psychic powers in this episode is. Um, so this is from Jane Esmondson. Uh, the fact that you're a slayer means you associate with demons. Therefore, infection through demon contact is sort of a professional hazard. Like, and then she goes into this thing about how, like, like how cops can become criminals. Like, uh, Buffy has special non-human powers. There's a hint of the demon world in her. This is an episode in which you think, uh, in which you got to explore the idea of Buffy having powers beyond human. Willow even thinks she's hardly even human anymore. Uh, so I think this is an episode where we take Buffy to the point of being a monster. The notion of a balance that you need to get, uh, you need the good and the bad to, uh, to balance, which the Whistler articulates, uh, has certainly been a part of the mythology and theology of the actual world, of our actual world uh, for a very long time. You need these two op uh, opposing forces. And Buffy is the captain of one of those, but her job would be meaningless without the others. Aww. I love Janice Swenson. She's amazing. Who is and, she? Is she a writer on the show? Yeah, she's, she wrote this episode. Oh, okay. She also became like a producer too. And, and she's still working in Hollywood, which is what's amazing. Um, but it's kind of like, I mean, Buffy already has like baseline somewhat psychic abilities. And it's like, you throw this on top of it. I mean, I think I feel like other episodes, she's had more psychic stuff happen. This is more she's like got her predictive dreams and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, I wonder I why it's pretty cool. the demons aren't better psychics. Like, Buffy's able to fake them out. They mostly seem to psychic <laughs> with each other. Maybe it's because they have, like, small, non-human brains. So, like, the full extent of the power can only be, like... Well, this is more of, like, just a, a straight-up mind-reading power, really, than, like, psychic, like, predicting the future type powers. Yeah. Yeah, I think the term psychic, like, is, like, a base... That covers a lot of this yes. stuff from Good telepathic, telekinetic, telekinetic. Like uh, text mix. But she can't communicate with the <laughs> demons at all, right? Or know what they're thinking, right? This power is like a, has a weird human it's one element. Way. Yeah, we never see her communicate with dogs or something. And then the demons, we, we assume they're communicating telepathically. Is that ever confirmed? Yeah. 
It is because they have no mouth. So the, the, it's That's just right, no mouth. Right. They don't have the mind project because they all can read minds. So they and just it's, think. it's supposed to be indicated in the first fight scene when like one of them ducks while the other throws a knife and stuff like that. But you oh, don't okay. like. They don't really go into these scabby demons. You know, I didn't rewatch the demon parts when I rewatched the, the, the ep- different, part. like, selective parts. Uh, Travis, <laughs> what are you saying? Oh, just how cringy the whole Wesley Cordelia thing is. I mean, it's like extra cringy. Um, yeah, I really uh, pump it up a notch this episode. Yeah, I asked um, my girlfriend Harriet, who's from England, about this um, because uh, I just was wondering if how it would read. To an English person, since Wesley is ostensibly an English person, because the uh, in England, the way I found out in the conversation, and because because the you're done with high school at 16, and Cordelia's character is supposed to be 18, right? Uh, and so what I found out was apparently the age of consent in England is 16, and the uh, the um, there are no more rights than you that you get after 18. Like you're a f- complete adult at 18. Wow. There's no like 21 yeah. thing like we have. Uh, so you can run. It's for still King creepy is what we determined though. Like uh, through the discussion is like we decided definitely still creepy regardless of cultural context because it's about Wesley's role. Right. Um, and it's yeah. about Cordelia's role. And she's, you know, in context, she's a high school student. And in context, Wesley is whatever Wesley is definitely some form of authority. There, authority it's, figure. So it's, it's <laughs> legit weird. He's even at the like, um, what do you call it? The spirit pep rally. rally or whatever? Pep rally. Like pep rally. He has what no reason talking? to be at that pep rally. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Well, what, yeah. well, Jen, what's, what's her read on Cordelia's um, desires? Like, what's her read on Cordelia? Is she like... She has a crush. Is she like, go girl? Or is she like, that's okay, just don't act on it? Like, what was her, what was her take on that? Cause that oh, that's, oh, I didn't ask Harriet about that specifically. Um, because we, he, we see Xander's got still a crush yeah. on, you know, teachers as well. That's a whole... It's like a one-way thing where it's like kind of normal for... A younger person to have a crush on someone yeah. older it's a lot of times it feels normal as long as it's not acted on right exactly i think it's so. fine for her to be an 18 year old kid to have a crush on an adult yeah obviously they sh- and again it's not about age so much as it's about power right yeah, it's, power. It's, it's about their their roles and the power of those roles yeah and there's yeah the, so, the social dynamic yeah yeah but i was just wondering what she would how she reads cordelia i have to ask her yeah that'd be awesome Hey guys, um, is Wesley gonna wait until Cordelia graduates? Yeah, probably. Got a couple more episodes to find out. My lips are sealed. Uh, uh, John, um, my brother was asking how you were and stuff, and I was like, "Oh, he's moving to England." And Liam told Liam told me the correct way to pronounce it is to pronounce uh, England is England. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that I know that now. <laughs> And I was like, oh, did you hear that from like a British person or something? And he was like, no, I read it in the dictionary. Um, so just so you know, it's England. It's good that you got this corrected right now. Oh, man. Phew. I that really could have saved me some embarrassment. <laughs> just like. Uh, I mean, right. how, you're not going to say England very often, though, right? Like, it's just like you don't say the United States very often. Liam think, has really weird ways of pronouncing things. And some of them is that he reads the dictionary a lot and then like reads the caption. And then some of them are like rules he's created in his head. Like he's another one that he said during our conversation was like, he was like, I had some hot chocolate, but he said, I had some hot choco late. And I was like, why did you say choco late? And he said, because like, if I say it took the, forever <laughs> specific combination of words, then I can go to hell for like a thousand years or something. So I avoid it by saying choco late. Um, so there's a <laughs> there's a lot of things going on with my brother's pronunciation of words. Wild. And then um, I also I also still love how the fact that there's still the writers still love angels behind the mirror. Just just watch out. Just turn around. You know, it, there's so many mirror gags. Just they love it. You know, it's like the first five times not enough. Like we gotta keep <laughs> going with this, guys. No, if I was if I was writing a vampire TV show, I would never get tired of it. I would yeah. set like so really, many hardly any vampires on in a show. house of mirrors. Just to, like, <laughs> <laughs> there's some really great mirror stuff. Um, 
Oh man. All right. Sorry. You got the next one. I do too still. Oh yeah. Mike, was it a surprise? Um, at the end for Jonathan, was it the surprise? Totally a surprise because they interrogated him and revealed nothing except he's a lonely dude. And not, I didn't realize he was so lonely he wanted to off himself. And then like, I even thought he was under a spell up until he said like, I'm lonely and depressed or whatever. And it's like, I, I still, I don't know. I have a prediction related to Jonathan we can get to later, but like, I still couldn't believe it when it was happening. It just felt such out, so out of character for him. I love how sweaty he was. He had this really sweaty desperation and it was like amazing. Yeah. I, I wondered about you and Jonathan, just because your experience with Jonathan, Jonathan has been so affected by like us talking about him all the time. Yeah. Right. So like this wouldn't be like a normal viewer experiencing this episode of first, first time and being like, Oh, that background character is actually going to kill people. You're like, Oh, Jonathan. The character. <laughs> Yeah, you guys all love you guys love Jonathan every episode he's in, uh, and so I was like annoyed and confused by how much attention you give him. And I see it happening with Wesley also, so I know that Wesley must turn around and become a better person that you guys like. When I don't know what you're breaks talking. with the Watcher Council, whatever it is. And so, like right now, you guys are all like, "Ah, Wesley sucks. Wesley's kind of he's kind of annoying." I'm like, "It's fine, you're a weirdo. Who gives a shit?" <laughs> also super weird you take and then back. like here he was gonna kill himself and you guys all love jonathan so i know there's a turnaround for this character where mm. he does something more loving or it's just the academy awards I, I don't know yet it's gonna be years before i discover the truth but anyway uh isn't it so cool that he's been this bit character for three seasons and <laughs> and like that he finally gets his time to shine like what like how cool is that as like a as like an extra to be hanging on and then like that gets to happen i don't know I, I was just thinking about how rare that is that you see like extras hang around for years on this on a tv set and then all of a sudden they get their awesome episode yeah and this is like i mean this is some he, real this legit is some real shit this is some real dramatic shit. acting which he had never done before right like yeah ah daddy's strong i hope he's getting paid enough that like he can stick around right this this has got to be his only gig at that time, I think it was, but he's, yeah. he's, doing, he's doing good for himself now. Okay, so predictions. Virgin predictions. Mike, you are currently at a 68.2%. It's going to fall, too. I can feel it. Dude. <laughs> okay. Uh in season two, episode 15, Mike, you predicted that this is not the last time that someone will assume Xander is gay. Now, oh. I'm not so sure if we can um, deny you this one, though, or confirm it, rather, because uh, it was Larry the first time, and it's Larry <laughs> the second time. So is it the same assumption? Does this count as the same assumption, or is it a new assumption? I just can't believe they did the same joke again. <laughs> I was cringing during that whole scene. I think it counts just because it's it's bringing it's bringing the same theme back, which is okay. Like, the prediction is like, all right, we'll give that one to you, Mike. I can't believe they did the same joke with the same person, though. Okay, so TV. Now, season two, episode twenty-two, Mike predicts that there will never be a Jonathan-focused episode. I don't think this counts. Jonathan. I don't think it counts is has a larger part to play in this episode than before but it's not focused on him uh okay he's just the red herring the twist like yeah i kind of agree with that i don't think oh. this is a jonathan episode yeah yeah that means there's a real jonathan episode coming all right can't wait <laughs> sorry my poker face totally broke Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay season three episode six Mike predicted that Giles slash Joyce will not talk about hooking up ever again. The show is going to respect their discretion. Now, does that mean that this is the first one I thought of? This was they will not talk about it with each other. I think the show did not respect their discretion. At all. <laughs> I thought it would never get brought up again, so it clearly did. Okay, all right, we'll deny that one. Yeah. I think that might be it. I, I, it's just interesting. The context of us being a psychic is what's required to bring that story up. They had it so locked down. 
but it's still top of mind. <laughs> Don't tell. <laughs> and indeed, yeah, that, that, that's the only ones that we have to do. Just the two. I thought there was more than that, but it's just the cool. two. Cool. I have two or new three. predictions okay. for you. Uh, one, Jonathan is going to have a full social recovery after this episode. Full social recovery. And the second one, um, this one, I don't know when it's going to take place. Faith is going to become a vampire. Oh, where'd that come from? There's just no other way, folks. She's on a dark road. <laughs> She's going to be the first slayer to be a vampire. I don't know how it will happen. Would you call her, uh, was it a slam pyre or a, or a, a layer? What would her... <laughs> you know, a slayer and a vampire. Like, what would, you, what would the cognate be? I think sl- slam pyre sounds terrible. <laughs> Slay pyre. pyre. What about slay pyre? Slay oh, wait, pyre. that's terrible. Vamper? Vamp layer? I'm just kidding. Ignore me. So the only way to figure it out is by making dad jokes until it like starts to make sense. It's like keep punning until yeah. you just keep uh, kicking the can down the road. Yeah. So I I don't know what season. I don't think it's this season. I just I feel like that's where her career is coming going. Okay. <laughs> Her career. It's, it's like Elijah Dushku. It's like Elijah Dushku will become a vampire. That's just kind of the way her career is going. Yeah, that's what's happening. You know, she has in real life aged a lot less than everybody else on this show. So just saying. Oh, Suspicious. Interesting. Oh, maybe in real life <laughs> became a vampire along with Keanu Reeves, famously. Famously a vampire, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> uh, he is? So my, uh, yeah. The kill count. My kill count for this episode is a pathetic two demons. Like probably our lowest kill count ever. So small. Um, and then my recommendations. recommendations uh the movie scanners uh which is a great psychic movie uh the dead zone uh stephen king's psychic movie and not super related to psychics but has like i mean has psychic abilities and stuff but more related to the road michael Pulley's going down the lawnmower man because uh, <laughs> what, what do you mean because <laughs> mike's experimenting with virtual reality and lucid dreaming uh so you're pretty close to becoming the lawnmower man right now (laughs) so i just want you to watch that movie uh as a cautionary tale don't get too far into virtual reality man i've had a lucid dream almost every night whoa whoa i don't know what's gonna happen i'm not controlling them though i'm just remembering Mm. them i'm just awake you're just a pawn i do feel like a pawn in my own mind Usually when I lucid dream, like I thought lucid dreams were like you have full control, but it's more like you're just aware, at least for me, it's like you're aware you're in a dream and it changes the way you can interact a little, but you're still just like a dude on a journey. You're not like controlling the journey, right? There are techniques apparently for controlling what the dream is about and what, what happens in it. They involve waking during your fifth sleep cycle, mm-hmm. fifth REM period. <laughs> Or there's this device that this book tries to sell. And it's like Google Calendar that it's still available, where supposedly you wear this uh, eye mask with orange uh, lights that are that go off when your eyes start to flicker into REM, which then, you know, eighty percent of the time, you interpret as just part of your dream world, but sometimes will awaken you. And if you are like, oh yeah, the lights, mm. and then you can be alert in the dream. All right, let's move on to the heavy shit now. Deep stuff. I feel like, I mean, this maybe this was supposed to be in questions. I don't know. But uh, I was looking forward to this because I feel like some of the heavier stuff we talk about, I feel like we're under qualified to talk about. Like we're yeah. just some, some guys. But we are of the exact age uh, to be a part of this. Uh, we were uh, juniors in high school uh, when columbine happened those kids were like almost exactly our age uh i looked a lot of this stuff up uh over the last few days 
we wore black trench coats. We wore yeah. black trench coats, although maybe they didn't. I saw the whole trench coat mafia thing was apparently a thing at the school, and it was like a group of people um, at Columbine High School, and they like had a photo in the yearbook. And but the um, the Columbine killers, the two of them, um, were not terribly associated with them. So. Although, yeah, we had this thing at the time where we were all wearing black trench coats. And then I think we all stopped doing it yeah. right beforehand. And then the whole Columbine thing happened, and we got a lot of looks afterwards. Probably because of the weather, right? Because it was in April. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That may have had something to do yeah. with it. <laughs> Good call. <sighs> I mean, how did it impact you guys? My memory is that it, it actually had surprisingly little effect at the time. That Columbine had little effect? Yeah, I mean, I don't recall that the school... I mean, Dennis, you were moved on to a new school by that time. But, yeah, um, but I mean, but for, I, I think for us, it us a lot. Yeah, almost nothing happened at Oakwood High School, is my memory. Although, you know, like school shootings is a perennial thing that as we're recording this... Um, there is, you know, it's in the news cycle now. Um, and I just want to say like that the kids of this generation are handling things a lot better than we did. Like they're being activists and the organized um, school walkout and stuff. Like we, we didn't do that. Um, so I just think the kids these days are doing good. Agreed. Yeah. I, I want to show support for them in whatever way we can so that they know that they should keep doing it. Cause like, you know, if it's money or whatever to encourage them to do it. Cause it's totally rad. That's happened. That's happening. And that's, that'll totally have an impact. Even if legislators ignore it now, those people are all going to vote next year. Yeah. A lot of them. It the was kids in my school walked out. <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, I mean, it, they, it's funny. The writers t- write about it. Like school shooters was like an old like trope, which is, which is really, you know, so disconcerting. This was 1999, even before, um, you know, there was like the high school that it was all the high school incidents and there's been so many, you know, since Columbine, but it, it's just, it's so disheartening that it was an old, the way they referred to it, it was just like, Oh God. Yeah. Nothing, nothing has changed for so long. And you're right. We didn't, we didn't walk out or do any protests at, at our high school. You know, part of it, we had an ultra conservative principal at the time, um, I'm remembering our our principal correctly. You know, I definitely regret that nothing, nothing important, nothing profound came out of that. But interestingly, at that time, the assault weapons ban was still in effect. That, that expired in 2004. So maybe we were lulled into a false sense of security because, hey, we had the assault weapons ban. I mean, clearly that's not enough, right? I remember um, in my high school... That same year, but I don't remember now if it was before or after the Columbine shooting, there was also an anthrax scare. Um, and it turned out it was one of the students had sent chalk in the mail, like claiming it was anthrax. And like, you know, like our whole school got shut down and everybody got bused to different schools while they were investigating and stuff. Um, so it was just, it was, I don't know. It was just definitely in the air that that feeling of like not being safe in the school, even if it wasn't from even if you weren't thinking like assault rifles could kill you, like there was still that feeling of like high school is dangerous. I was talking to my wife about this episode and she's like, I was like, Oh, Columbine. And she's like, Oh, in Virginia tech, it happened too. Right. And I was like, no, that's later. Right. It's just like, there's been so many. She's like, Oh, the Virginia tech one. Oh, was it, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the Batman one. Cause that's, that's much later, you know? (laughs) Yeah. There's just so many of Aurora, them. The Aurora one, right? Aurora. Yeah. yeah. But I think before UT is, the, is, is they think the immediate reference in this episode. That's why oh, it's up in a tower. Yeah. Yes. Um, the but the, um, I think the way that we thought, at least in my memory, the way that we thought about violence in, spe- like in, in schools was really different before and after Columbine. The, the, this idea of like a, uh, like, as I recall, when we people talked about guns in schools, it was a inner city problem it was related to gang violence it was black kids that was how we thought about it starter jackets yeah it was and the way we reacted to it was all based on that uh and then after columbine there was an idea that it could be the an affluent thing that it could be connected to mental illness and all these other stories that we tell about it right um and i think that definitely started with columbine and 
which is interesting though, because that this episode almost seems because it, it's immediate references UT. It, it almost seems to have more of this like serial killer vibe to it that mm-hmm. that we have with Columbine, rather than thinking about like urban violence. It just it's a different flavor to the story people are telling about it. Yeah, I, when I, I think, yeah, Columbine was the first time it was kind of that, that, that narrative of like, it's the bullied kids. Right. Right, which is, Jonathan fits into that weirdly. Yeah, uh, I think that's really interesting. The whole, like, this whole like, Revenge of the Nerds narrative. That, yes. uh, and this episode takes a pretty hard line that that narrative is not true or helpful. Eh, I, now, do, do you think it was pure think accident was, that they got the white male shooter, right? I mean, I mean, was that just because Buffy's not a diverse cast? Or do you think they really got the white male as the shooter honed in? Because now it's, it's clearly white men um, who kill people at school. I mean, the, the way that this episode is playing with it, right? It's like the Jonathan thing is total red herring. Like, and he's not going to shoot other people. He's just right. going to shoot himself. And they set it right. up as a trick for the audience to reference UT, right? Whatever the most well-known school shooting or shooting at that mass shooting at the time. And it's a trick. And then he's actually going to kill himself with a rifle somehow. And like, that's, I'm not saying, I, sorry, John, you, you had a point before Travis was asking about the white male thing. You were, and, and if you could repeat that, sorry. You just that saying. like, I, I feel like this, they, and you're right. That the, It's interesting that it's not, He's not going to hurt anybody but himself, right? Yeah. But I do think that Buffy says to him, like, you feel this sense that you're being excluded, that nobody wants to talk to you, nobody wants to be around you. But what you need to realize is that your pain is just like everybody else's pain, everybody else's experience. I feel like Buffy is, is refuting a certain Revenge of the Nerds narrative of, like, you know, you're like, as a geek, you feel special, you feel excluded, you feel like right. nobody gets you. And the point Buffy makes to him is that that is a fundamentally selfish way of looking at the world. And that's the thing her powers taught her this episode is like empathy, right? Yeah. I don't feel like, so in, in related to the white comment though, like I don't, or that you were talking about Travis, like I don't think Buffy has really dealt with race that much that I've in this episode, in this show at all. Yeah. So uh, what I I was saying is they nailed the profile. Oh yeah, totally. Is is it by accident? Probably because because it's just, not, I mean, I was just sort of saying, do you think it was an accent because it's an all white cast? Um, do you think it was deliberate? I mean, clearly now we know white male shooter. Danger, danger, danger. I will yeah. say I don't, I think it's not an accident in as much as most, if most male shooter, the most Buffy, shooter. if Buffy were to have written about uh, a school shooting that was, uh, you know, was a black kid, they wouldn't have written it this way probably, right? right. It's written within a, a, a certain mindset of what a school shooter is right that it's they're said, John, the inwardly nerd. troubled say what it's the lonely nerd like you were yeah the lonely nerd yeah. In the bomber type. yeah i think that he i think it's not an accident that it's that it's a white character because that's the the, the archetype they're working out of right but they also like hint at the school shooter could be the news the journalist right because he's uh i don't know i don't know why I don't know he's a misanthrope he's you know yeah uh and also this crazy teacher you know, that doesn't really like, I don't, does that story get concluded with the teacher? No, uh, it's barely no, just asks, asks him directly and that's it. <laughs> hey, you're going to kill people tomorrow for the yearbook. <laughs> and then it away. ends up being this banal, you know, the person that's trying to kill people is going to do it in their food <laughs> at school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually wonder uh, to get sillier for a second, like, Xander saves everybody, I guess. But like, did anyone eat that rat poison before uh, he got? Oh to- yeah, who knows? Yeah. Also, like, there were a lot of people eating that Jello. Xander saved a lot of people just then. I'm wondering who is like. It may be up there with how many high school students Buffy has saved. <laughs> he say he saved because she got a lot at once. Is all I'm saying. He got, he a, got lot a lot at once. once. Yeah, that's true. I guess Buffy's gotten a lot at once too, though, at, at, at certain points. So, um, I mean, I mean, one of my there's a double thing here where where men are more likely than 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 women to co- <laughs> to successfully commit suicide with a gun to um, to have a suicide um, attempt and and end their life. I think Buffy also got that right by accident, um, and gun is the preferred method for men um, for males. 
So, I mean, I think a lot of it is, I mean, some of it, they probably did some research because they're, you know, they're, they're a network show. I'm sure they had someone doing some research, um, but it's, they, I think they got some of this bright by accident. It's also the second time Buffy's tried to uh, like talk somebody, third time somebody's tried to talk somebody back from the just brink better. by like abusing them, by like yelling better. at them. Like uh, she, uh, when she like talks to, she tries to talk Angel down from suicide by oh. telling him that his pain doesn't count. This is her she redemption tries, episode. She tries to talk down, uh, what's her name, who is in an abuse situation right. um, by, by telling her just to like be this tough about it. Yeah. But yeah, I, just, I don't <laughs> think she does that in this episode. I mean, this No, episode, I guess not. This is very specifically about her like, relating to people like yeah. she's not angry yeah she's like we all feel these pains like i learned empathy through magic powers yeah um no i agree and i'm also way more on buffy's side about this I, it like i feel like around the time i was jonathan's age was in this episode is when i figured out that like oh people aren't like being mean to you because of you that's just how people are and there's nothing like you're not owed anything and you were you learned that episode you learned that lesson by watching Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion, right? I don't think I've ever seen that movie, Dennis. Is that is that what that's no, no, about? You, it's, it's, it's You've totally seen the movie. For you not to have seen that, John. I've I seen have not seen that movie. Five to ten. I, I, I have no Lisa Kudrow's in it. I have a very specific yeah, memory of you talking about how you had like um, a script in your head, and then you watched that movie, and you're like, oh, it did everything I wanted to do in my script. Oh, uh, so you've definitely watched that movie because yeah, it was oh. about people who thought they were bullied, and then they find out that they were the bullies. Oh, and you totally, yes. you totally <laughs> told me you, you were like, I'm not going to write that anymore because I watched Romy Michelle's high school reunion. Oh, I, so wow. Good. I apparently totally <laughs> forgot all about it. So I, I had my, the theme question at the top here, which was that our expectations of school shooters have changed since this episode aired. And I wonder how you would do this in a modern show, like how you would handle school shooters. And I think Travis, you hinted at like, Oh, this would be the first, this would be a pilot episode for an extended season. Obviously you'd lose the rat poison in the cafeteria, but like, you, you know, what, what would be the characteristics? Here's my, here's what I'm curious about. So like, what would be the characteristics of the shooter now? And then how would the gang, cause they're going to solve the school shooter. Like how would they go about it? And then, would I mean, I, you'd also have to have a supernatural element. We'll figure out what that is. But well, like, so how would what would be the characteristics be of those? Well, uh, the first oh. season of American Horror Story has a school shooting. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. So I think that is the most contemporary thing we can point to because it also has a supernatural element. It's like the kid who's a loner weirdo, and it turns out he's a ghost, and it turns out he's a ghost of a school shooter. Um. So it isn't. I mean, it's treated a lot heavier than this episode is, but it's also because. American Horror Story is not a great show. <laughs> it's not really uh, treated with the weight it, a big subject like this deserves. So no, so there's been no... Question of what would a good version of a show like this yeah. do in a, this contemporary setting? Because I think, I think Travis is right. This would be like the full season. And maybe the thing closest to this is like 13 Reasons Why, right? Where, yeah. Which is about suicide, but it's like... Every episode is an. Ex I haven't actually watched Thirteen Reasons Why because I don't want to watch things about suicide. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it seems like it's like every episode is examining one of the reasons why this person claims they committed suicide, right? Right. Um, so it'd probably be something similar to that. But right, because I mean, it's such a serious subject, and there hasn't been a serious show about it, right? Yeah. Uh, Thirteen Reasons Why. Apparently, the second season is going to be about a school shooting. Okay. Oh. Which is, I mean, I mean, the, it's so it's weird. A, it's, it's, another it's, season of a show I'm not going to watch. I mean, the problem, I mean, it, the weird thing is there's been so many that have happened. It's just, it boggles the mind. It's, it, you think it would be a, a very simple or, or straightforward show because there's been so many real life examples. And that you, you feel like every high school show that's set in a high school has to have should, a school shooter should. episode. Yeah, it should. Like to be... Yeah, um, I mean, there's probably one on Saved by the Bell, you know. Yeah, I'm sure I think that kind of episode. Yeah. The, the the question is whether or not you frame it in terms of bullying, right? And I think uh, my hope is is that they wouldn't, because I think that's a really tired narrative, and it it doesn't capture a lot of the reality of these things. I think nowadays it wouldn't. Like if there was a period of time where yeah. it was like this was the bully type episode, but now right. no one we know. I think that yeah, that's out. I think there'd be a much more realistic 
I think what Mike, Mike was getting at, would it be more realistic? Yes, way more realistic, I think, um, when it went it, for the motivations, for sure. Well, I think they definitely have multiple suspects, you know, in the same way this had multiple suspects, you know, and they're, you know, you'd have the more obvious person that was the more like bullied person as the red herring, as the person you'd be most worried about. And then they would probably just commit suicide or whatever in a school shooting thing. And then it'd be this other person that was just like hated people for another reason or hated, you know, was unloved for different reasons that were invisible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it just, that's what you think about when you watch this episode. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, much like Dennis says, I mean, this is such a real obvious problem. I don't want to watch a TV season about this. I want this problem to, to have real resolution. I don't need to go through this. I mean, it, it's nice that Buffy does the monster of the week to have the monster that can't be the monster, but yeah, um, this is like one of those things where it's just, you know, just so frustrating. Yeah. People people seem like they see whatever narrative they want to see in school shootings. Like people who want to bring people who want to tell a story about bullying are going to see a story about bullying in school shootings. People who want to see like if you're Michael Moore and you're you know you're going to look at it Columbine, you're going to see a story about the you know larger violence in American culture or whatever. If you are interested in gun control, you're going to see a story that's about gun control. And you know, I mean, I have my own stories that I see in it, and for me, yeah, gun control is the story there but it really does seem like it's a big Rorschach test and people kind of tell the story out of it that they want to tell. So I think a TV writer would have to do that because what else yeah. can you do? Yeah. Or cause you got a whole TV season. You can explore all those aspects, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So maybe um, one episode is to the bullying. One episode is due to, Failure in the safety checks of who should or should not be on lists. Another one is about the danger of social media. Another one is about um, substance abuse and mental illness. Another episode. I mean, yeah, you can certainly, and it goes on and on and on. Yeah, you could definitely have a. Jeez, you're season. really nailing it. <laughs> well, you can have, you know, like I said, we've been through this in America for so long. Yeah. I saw that it's article, John, that your dad posted on oh, Jesus the Christ. News. Yeah. So uh, speaking of, yeah, so Dayton people are here. The, the current uh, state representative for a good chunk of Dayton uh, has proposed that students should be allowed to carry guns. So like his specific recommendation is that uh, high school seniors age 18 and up should be allowed to, to carry long guns, not handguns, but long guns in school. Since they're allowed to anyway, they should be allowed in school. Yeah. So, I yeah I got I'm so fast. jealous you're moving to England. Um, England. <laughs> it's oh, England. I'm so jealous you're England. <laughs> England does not have these problems. No, they don't. And I got to tell you, it's gonna be amazing for you. Though. My attitudes about gun control have really been affected by being in a relationship with somebody from another country, because she looks at this and it's just like you know I look at it, and you know because of my American background I'm like oh you know. Uh, the second amendment is one important value, but blah, 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 blah. And she looks at it and she's just like, you people are insane. How about no guns? That would be sane. And I got to say, I am. You're so lucky. I'm feeling that. That makes a lot more, have a lot more sense to me now than it did uh, when I was younger. <laughs> it's yeah. really, it's really crazy. I, the, you know, cool. And even like mass shootings aren't really the problem. Right. And I'm going to get on a soapboxy here thing or we can cut this out, but like mass shootings only account for a tiny sliver of people who die from handguns it's it's and it's not it's not assault rifles either or you know whatever it's it's a it's a bunch of really ordinary shit it's yes it's mainly suicides a lot of accidents a lot of individual homicides right and it's not assault weapons it's not big scary military looking guns it's not all ar-15s like yeah. if we actually want to make a dent in people who are dying from guns we have to say that semi-automatic guns have to go which means ordinary guns and like there is i feel a, like that's actually a mainstream opinion but people are afraid to say it like there was a shooting outside my apartment last week um yeah and the shooter or the the victim i thought he was actually the shooter he walked by my apartment and then like the cops swarmed on him and the way they were treating him, I thought he was a shooter because I just, I didn't Jesus. open my door, obviously, but I could hear them yelling at him and like, yeah, you know, I didn't realize he was like 
bleeding out on the ground and stuff in front of my apartment. But oh Christ, you know the cops I'm definitely sorry, tried, treated him like he was the shooter. They're like, "Why were you there? What like? Why did you have a gun and stuff?" So I guess both people had the gun, had the gun. I heard like six shots in a row, really quick, which made me think it was like a semi-automatic because it was like, you know, yes. uh, in Santa Rosa. Yeah, yeah, it happened right in my parking lot, like. Yeah, I mean, this thing happens. And then the next day in Yontville, there was a hostage situation, which is where yes. my aunt lives. There was a hostage situation at the veterans home. Yeah. Um, so it was like a really crazy week last week for me with guns. Where I was just like... Yeah, we had a hostage situation here last week, like over in Northwest Portland. That's like a really nice part of Portland. It was shocking. Yes. It's all over all the time, right? Every, every yeah. day there's a mass shooting in America. Um, there's over 300 and some odd mass shootings how many people had fun target shooting last week you know like who gives a fuck yeah who gives a fuck jesus so So buffy virgin is pro-gun control (laughs) you heard it here first (laughs) we're we're gonna get so much hate from the nra episode is um (laughs) like deals with such serious topics i want to bring up my theme discussion thing which is like that usually buffy deals with real world problems with a metaphor to code it um but I, this episode, the metaphor is wrapped up in something else. It's wrapped up in the high schooler having psychic powers, which teaches her empathy or something. Um, so to me, I wonder, like, should the shooting and the suicide be addressed on a more magical level? Or are these problems just so big and so large that they, like, rip past the metaphor and just have to be dealt head on? Like, because usually what the metaphor is about is like, my boyfriend is mean to me now. So now he's, you know, it's like using the vampire metaphor for something like in your daily life, you know, but this is like something that unfortunately is part of daily life as Travis has pointed out, but like is too large maybe for the like fictional fantasy coding we want for it, you know? Um, so anyway, that's, that's what I was thinking about. I mean, it's, the hyper empathy that triggers the monster like is the that triggers Buffy's ability to even see that this is coming. Otherwise, Jonathan just kills himself, right? Without yeah. her in this hyper empathy. Which by the time she gets to Jonathan, she doesn't have that power anymore. She's just her regular Buffy self. She's not a hyper empathetic empathic person. So she solves the per you know, it feels very T V friendly where it's like hey that was you all you know you have those powers all along to like understand what's going on with people uh there's definitely a a bit of that like monster metaphor yeah but it's it doesn't it kind of just becomes more human right yeah i guess it's just that it's like a real gun that he he doesn't have like a videodrome gun or something (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah yeah uh, uh or like he isn't like you like you thought he might have been possessed by a spell he's not possessed oh. by a spell he's suicidal right um and it's maybe just like there i don't know i was just thinking about this idea of like there are some things that are so large they can't be dealt with on the fantasy basis yeah some some big societal problems yeah i mean the things that work best in the fantasy basis are those Personal problems, adolescent problems, relationship problems. Yeah, definitely. I think you're right. I don't. I, I think they barely they barely deal with it at the end of this episode, but they don't they don't sugarcoat it with magical stuff, which yeah. is nice. There's no there's no um, you know magical fairy dust spr- you know sprinkled on the top of Jonathan's like suicide attempt. It's like no, he had to go to counseling. He yeah. got suspended. That was good. I mean, it's also it's always that thing with Buffy. It's like, man, well, this episode needs another. 10 minutes or another five minutes uh, yeah let's follow jonathan the counseling it's like um, can we can we lose the comical fight scene in the in the cafeteria you know? yeah the shift in tone is so weird it's jarring <laughs> no it, i mean it's clearly an executive producer decision right <laughs> or something is how it feels yeah yeah and i uh, yeah and it feels like you know maybe they they weren't setting out to make like this heavy episode. This is just where the story (laughs) found its way. Right. And it's also, but this is like the fifth time. There's like the fifth or 10th time. Like there's something really heavy and it's like, Oh, we can't really end on that. You know, they add the rat poison after Columbine. Do they add that scene? I don't think so. No, Uh, but I don't know. Um, Um, It feels like that's always how it was structured to be like, yeah. Yeah. 
I think it maybe though, if like there hadn't been a bunch of school shootings, uh, you know, I mean, afterwards, I mean, obviously there were some beforehand, but like, I feel like this would play differently if Columbine hadn't happened. Like you might, the episode might not read as quite so serious. I mean, definitely, <laughs> definitely yeah. the like suicide talking down from suicide scene is pretty serious, but like, I feel like there's a lot we're bringing to it that the episode didn't have in mind. Yeah. I mean, this episode would be very different if there weren't real life school shootings. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, or or if the last one anybody could remember was was University of Texas, if that was all our main, you know, reference, it would feel a lot different. Uh, so I'll just say um, the other kind of theme I was thinking about is the interpretation of Buffy's psychic powers in this episode as mental illness, um, like the hearing voices as her power is like a symptom of like some mental illnesses. Um, oh sure, yeah. So one I'm, you know, familiar with through my brother. Uh, so and the episode doesn't really dwell on it. I mean, it just it does make a couple comments about like she'll go insane, but um, I would just like to think this is like a borderline positive portrayal of mental illness, just because the mental illness doesn't lead her to violence. Um, which like usually when they portray somebody as like schizophrenic or something on a show, they're violent, you know. Um, so she's still Buffy. She uses her insights for good, um, and she's not any more violent than she usually is. So I don't know if that was an intended interpretation. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Just something I was thinking about. Yeah. Uh, so Mike, uh, how do you rate <laughs> this episode? So uh, despite the insanity that we're talking about, I really enjoyed watching this episode in part because I think of the weird, like time warp, sad time warp of this problem not being solved. And then I not really having memories of how school shootings were treated pre Columbine. Like I, I didn't know that shoes shows really dealt with that in the world of supernatural kind of fun shows like, like this. So like it just every, like all the jokes like hit really hard to me. Like I laughed too hard at every one of Xander's gags and like, you know, Cordelia's joking about school shootings. So like, I don't know. It just felt like a, like a simpler time, but still deeply mm -hmm. sad. So like, I want to see more episodes like this and I don't mean literally like this, but just episodes that like make it clearer, like what the world was like before nine 11 and before Columbine and like before Iraq and Afghanistan and shit, like stuff that's just like clear line in the sand of what the world was like before. And like, I know you guys are really nostalgic for uh, the iRobot episode, you know, where, you know, there's like talking about like this early cyber cyber in the computer kind of villain or whatever. And like, you know, early weird net internet stuff. This was more impactful for me. I really like this one. I didn't care so much for early internet as much, but this was great. Uh, this like this like made me think a lot, and it was really painful and funny. And then it's stupid too. It was great. I want more episodes like this. Awesome, thanks. Uh, this has been Buffy Virgin. I'm Dennis St. John. You can buy my comics on Amazon. I'm on Twitter at Dennis Comics. Uh, Mike, where can people see you? Lucid Dream. Oh, geez. On my YouTube channel, uh, Michael Poli. And a shout out here, uh, David Yoder, who's been a guest on the show, started a new podcast uh, where he watches Smallville with his roommates. I'm sure Dennis will be on it. I'm going to um, be on the second episode. The oh, Bug Boy. Awesome. We're on Buffy Virgin. We're about to get out of high school. So, of course, I ah. need to start doing a new podcast where I'm going to be trapped in high school again. <laughs> You're right back in high school, man. <laughs> but the podcast is called save me from this podcast and i wrote a rap song that plays in the intro which i like i heard the other day uh yesterday and it just filled me with so much joy uh so anyway I, i'm excited to listen to that podcast that's it's, even though I, I don't care about smallville so much but i listened to the first 15 minutes it is damn funny uh yeah. to hear yoder interview his former roommates who had no knowledge of smallville before he forced them to listen or watch it right over and he also interviews his parents yeah it is weird <laughs> it is a weird fun show all right uh thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time